I mean, right, so tell me a little bit about uh, one of the processes that goes on with burn. So you get burned, you need to help to heal that skin as quickly as possible. So some of the goals we have for wound care, minimizing the infection, breaking the site for enclosure, promote healing, and ultimately to minimize the scar formation as best as possible. So hydrotherapy, um, we don't use hydrotherapy anymore and actually shouldn't be utilized anymore. Um, this is an example of one of the large hover tanks we used to use dunk the entire body of the person in the hopper tank, try to clean it up in between there. And what they found was that if someone had a small infection somewhere there and got in the hopper tank, the next patient that came in there would get that same infection and kind of spread that infection around the whole hospital, the whole group there. So they don't routinely do these anymore. Sometimes they will do them in some cases, but try to stay away from this. And what we typically do is much more topical therapy and much more debridement. And again, debridement is just removing some of the devitalized tissue via scalpel or sutures or even a small pair of scissors taking that breeding area off so the bacteria doesn't have any of that dead tissue to eat on there, promote that healing process. Topical therapy is probably the most common thing you'll see in terms of the burn care management. Uh, sulfamylon is the most common used material as well as sulfur sulfadiazine or SSD or silvadine. Um, those are bacterial side from any gram positive and gram negative bacteria. It should be applied twice a day in these cases because it's only effective for about a 12 hour cycle and not a 24 hour cycle. Sulfamylon can be applied once a day, but it has to be poured into a solution. So you have to kind of soak the entire person's body with that application there. Typically now, most of the folks are moving to more silver-based antimicrobials. Literally, there's thousands of different silver-based antimicrobials that are out there and different kinds of material. But usually some application to help mitigate some of that bacterial load and ultimately clean the wound up as fast as possible and get that closure as quickly as possible. So kinds of grass that we apply to the skin here. Um, so Homograph or allograph is actually called cadaver skin. It's just crowd preserved ca cadaver skin is utilized. We have a number of different skin banks um, throughout the cities and the countries that are utilized where we just get donor skins and reprocess those donor skin materials. The good thing about this is that it can be applied to the top of the skin, provides a moist wound healing environment there, so it's to promote that healing process there, but it won't integrate into the skin surface there. The body will start to reject it anywhere from five to seven days, but it gives you a temporary closure to the area there helps to shut off some of that pain from the nerve vessels is a good moist healing to occur in that process. We also use heterographs or xenographs, pigskin material. And again, same application for that one, all temporary closure techniques, helps to minimize pain, get good coverage of the skin area. <clears throat> this is an example of, um, it should be like this picture over here, which is sterilized and, and non-spotted. This is a spotted pig that somehow got through the um, process and pasteurization process there. So we applied it on this guy, took a picture of it. I was kind of like, that's really kind of cool. So what we ultimately want to do in those deeper second degree burns and obviously a third degree burn injury is to apply a skin graft, an STSG, a split thickness skin graft, where a portion of the skin is harvested, used from the upper thigh on the top layer of skin and a portion of that secondary layer of skin there. Not deep enough that the skin won't regrow, but just slight enough there so it has some ability to promote healing on top of there. This is done via a sheet or a mess or a postage stamp graph. Sheet graphs um, ideally are the best done for the hands and the face and the neck area there because it provides the best cosmetic function. Um, but in some cases, you'll see that this hand for a 60 or 70% burn injury, you don't have that luxury of doing those sheet graphs every time. The good thing about a, a a, uh, a mesh graft is that all those small holes allow for angiogenesis to occur and to pull good moisture into that wound bed there and allow for that skin to attach effectively to, this, to the area that's been burned. We also do um, full thickness skin grafting here. This is where you're going to have an actual full thickness part of the skin there where a small portion is going to be grafted off there. The top picture is a guy whose thumb is sewn into his abdomen and the bottom picture here is a transverse um, pectoral flap for a facial injury. Provides for vascular flow to the area there, allows for good take. This can be done over areas that have exposed bone, exposed tendon, or exposed teeth structures. Areas where a normal skin, a uh, split thickness graft will not adhere to. You have to have that good dermal bleeding surface there. These guys have to be, have a good bleeding surface to allow for that skin graft to attach. If you don't have a good bleeding surface there, the skin's not gonna heal up over time, and you're not gonna get, you're gonna get failure of that skin grafted area. The full thickness graft actually has a little bit more soft and susceptibleness to it there, and it'll have more flexibility than this, the split thickness graft. Sure. He's being sewn right in here into his hip. So 
This is the portion of the skin that's sewn around the top. He lost the top portion of his hand there, and he's sewn right here in his hip. And then he's kept in place there for about three to four weeks, and then he comes back in. They'll cut that portion off, close up the area here, and that skin will be reattached to the top portion of the stall. And the same thing here. So he had that transverse pectoral flap there. That's kept in place there. It's kept alive for about three to four weeks. And then they'll transect the area here in the pectoralis, close that off primarily here, and this area will be reclosed and reattached to the face. So yeah, he'll be open that time. They'll put, they'll put, usually put um, a homograph on top of that one, or there's a lot of good skin substitutes right now that can be utilized, kind of keep the area moist and intact there and keep it clean, and then they'll reclose that area primarily. For that one there, well, the pig skin can be utilized for that, but he had exposed bone and exposed tendon on that area there. So the pig skin is not going to allow for vascular ingrowth to the area there. Only applying a dermal structure on top of that will allow for the vascular ingrowth to kind of create a permanent fix. This guy was pretty bad. Um, it was a real deep area there. They tried to see a picture of him. They tried a, a synthetic material called Integra on top of him that failed, and then they had to go back and do a full thing and scrap with him as well. Yep. Absolutely not. No freaking questions. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. So yeah, so from my standpoint, um, and this is I would press this anytime. So for the pigskin material, that is not going to attach to the body, to that skin. It's it's not going to permanently integrate. It's just a temporary wound closure. So unless there was some kind of exposed tendon or exposed joint that was you know, they were concerned about for exposing that joint, tearing that joint, I would say range of motion should be going on all the time in those cases. For the split thickness skin graft, those guys, for that graft to adhere, usually in the hand, we put them in a protective splint or in the elbow, we'll have them in a splint, so they won't be able to move for at least two, sometimes five days. Anywhere else that's not crossing the joint, they can start to mobilize and start to get those guys up and going. The thing you want to watch out for with them is that if it's on an area where, say, someone has something on their buttocks or on their hips, and you're trying to get the person to stand, if you try to lift them up from that standpoint, they're going to slip the graph off. But usually within 48 to 72 hours, as long as there's no other secondary complications, most of what you have from that graph standpoint is going to be there. Anything else that's not attached is most likely not going to make it. Great question. Though. That's a really good question. And for full thickness graph? Full graph. So these guys... We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to mobilize them at all for that three-week period. They would keep them. This guy here, you know, he was, we had to make, I made a jacket for him. So he actually Velcroed around his whole body there and used that, but he kept that arm down there. These guys won't be mobilized. He can get up and walk and do everything like that, but nothing moving to that joint there because you want to have that integration. You want to create that good dermal structure and epidermis tissue. Usually about three weeks for those guys there. And yeah, mostly it's because we have mobilized. Like, that's like you're talking about as a flap. Mm -hmm. like yep. If they do the full thickness, do they ever do full thickness remotely? It's hard because um, even you can see, I mean, this guy with this flap here, that's a, a small area, that dorsal structure there. Usually with the vascular issues, with the burns, they don't survive unless they have that good vascular flow overall. So usually we limit those ones. There are some temporary materials that are coming in the next like five to seven years that might be able to change that process but right now it has to kind of be kept in place there yep there's no limitations on exercising absolutely not nope get those guys up and moving you're gonna see in most of those cases when someone gets that skin graft and has a graft place they're gonna routinely say the area the skin came from is more painful than where the graft is and a lot of that is because you just harvested off those nerve endings. You've cut down to that, essentially, that second degree area there. And those nerve endings are on fire now. And they're like, what the hell am I doing? Usually the donor site material, too, is not the most complementary. It's usually used a, a cheap material that because it's going to heal up anyways in about seven to ten days. So they put that on there, and it tends to be a little painful for the area. Um, and I'll throw another one at you. We published a paper in uh, 2013. Uh, for a guideline protocol for lower extremity ambulation. And what we found was that um, there's no difference in 
what is utilized in terms of management. The key thing is these guys should be up and moving for the lower extremity graft, anywhere that's not crossing a joint, that should have a splint on, but if it's not crossing a joint, ace wrap and mobilize. Doesn't matter day one, day two, day 10, or whatever. We should be getting those guys up and moving. There is no contraindication for them. Um, and that was one of the things we tried to push to our docs uh, here at the hospital. They didn't take it too well. And I'm like, well, the data's right here. I mean, you said to go publish it, so here it is. But yeah, we, we want these guys moving routinely. I mean, almost every joint, I would say, um, for a hand, they should have a splint on. If they don't have a splint on that hand, that means it's not crossing the whole joint. It's not, it's not deep enough for those areas there. But otherwise, they should be splinted and protected. But there's nothing saying they can't do elbow, shoulder, and mobilization and do feeding activities, <clears> anything <throat> they want to do with that splint on for that protective phase. Great question. You guys are actually paying attention. This is actually great. So we'll talk a little about some biosynthetics and some skin substitute materials. I'll kind of just get you guys in terms of what's happening here. Um, so this is a material called BioBrain, and actually it's going off the market in the U.S. from what I've heard so far. It's a synthetic material made out of bovine collagen in a nylon matrix, and these are made into gloves and different materials. And the idea behind this was this would be on a second-degree burn that was a superficial one. So it's going to heal up on its own eventually with normal wound care and management. It's not going to require a skin graft. The downside with it is that we can kind of see a difference between these two here. This guy looks like a normal left hand function, looks pretty good. This guy is looking a little fat and swollen and nasty. So he was deeper on his right hand than his left. And when they applied the material on here, the downside is that once that deeper structure is, is, has injury in there and it's not going to heal, all that bacteria and stuff is getting trapped under that stuff there and creating a pussy event and creating pain for this guy. This guy had to be removed for that case. CEA um, is cultural epithelial autograph material. Uh, the, the bad name for that is called scar in a jar. Essentially, it's the epidermal structure of the scaffold matrix. You can take a postage stamp um, imprint of someone's skin cells, send them to a lab in Boston, and they can create inf infinitous amounts of sheets of material of epidermal skin for you. So it's a very good life-saving maneuver. It can help these guys out here. The downside is looking at that skin, you can kind of see it does not look like normal skin. They get these uh, pustules that will kind of form in different areas here. They're very prone to wounds and injuries there because you're only looking at the epidermal structure, that very thin avascular structure base. There's no dermal component to help support good vascular blood flow in good area. But the nice thing is that this guy was a 98% burn injury. So he was burned his entire body starts up the, the soles of his feet and the top of his head. So this guy survived that injury there. Um, on a very interesting little note there is that they found in some of these cases is that when they regrow these skin cells, they can genetically mutate and cause cancer in some of those areas. So there's been some recent research in some, some of these guys have actually had cancer because of the CEA material that has affected their body. So it's like, well, you you got saved for 15 years, but you died of cancer later on. I mean, there's a lot of question marks going go on ethically. Um, alderm is another composite material here. <clears throat> this is incorporated into the body structure itself here. This is, again, made of uh, bovine collagen and a, and a matrix of, of other amino acids and proteins. And it creates that dermal template. It helps to integrate that dermal structure into your own body. And then a skin graft is placed over top of this. You're going to see this a little, later, a little later on down the road. What this does is it provides more of that supple area of the skin surface there. It gives you more of that cushioning approach there and allows for a very good vascular embed growth of blood tissue the area to allow the skin graft to heal. Integra um, is another material. This has kind of been a lifesaver in terms of burn management right now. It's synthetic material. It's a two-stage <coughs> process. It's again made of that bovine collagen matrix and some other materials. It has a silicone membrane on it. This material is... is harvested, it's applied to the skin surface there, and then that silicone matrix is kept in place for about, again, two to three weeks. You allow for that vascular ingrowth to occur, and really key is over top of tendon bellies, over top of um, uh, very acute uh, bone areas, and then you'll rip off, you, de you take off the silicone component, and then another skin graft is applied over top of that, and that becomes permanently incorporated in this material. Uh, again, it's, it's been fantastic in terms of long-term care over top of tendon bellies. You can actually do some excursion 
for tendon issues and actually watch those tendons kind of move and see if they're actually gliding. It's really kind of cool from that perspective. Um, and this has done some really great stuff for some deeper injuries of care and management. This is a new material. This is called Superthel. The cool thing about this material is that it's 100% synthetic. There's no bovine, there's no other collagen, there's no other matrices in this material. It's 100% synthetic. Essentially, it's made up of polycaprolactone. It's a lactic acid, uh, kind of like the monomers that are used for micro sutures. It's applied to the skin surface, and then it actually breaks down and becomes lactic acid. As this heals up over time, it allows for the, the skin cells to heal around it and pull into it. This is an example of a, a scalp donor site. You can kind of see. That's the donor site area. This is the white material applied on top, and this is healing about eight days later. It's a one-time dressing application. It has an antimicrobial matrix to it, so there's no silver in it as well, so it's kind of a different look in terms of management of, of cases. Um, it's only for um, second-degree burn injuries. It's not for deeper injuries. So if you have a deeper injury, this stuff's not going to work. But again, kind of thinking of the next generation of materials that are out there. <coughs> so here's some of those donor sites we talked about, the harvest of the skin here. And this will get some examples. This is a material called Scarlet Red. Uh, this is a material called BGC. This is opsite, essentially tegaderm being over top of a donor site. If you can imagine what that would feel like, having opsite stuck to a second degree burn injury, hurt, painful as hell. This is a material called Aquacell AG. It's all separate components on donor sites. They all do essentially the same thing. They provide a temporary covering to that donor site. It dries off and flakes off as it heals underneath of it and it's trimmed to the area. The good thing about donor sites is that these will heal again about 8 to 14 days, but you can literally harvest right over top of them again. So they had a donor site here about 12 days before, and they had another graph in the same area here, right on top of that same donor site. So they do it right in those times there. Our body can continually reheal the area there, we harvest the same area there, minimize donor site morbidity, and allow for better healing overall. And these guys normally do not scar. I've probably seen about two or three um, that have scarred in some areas there. But usually they don't scar. The only time they do scar, if there's a secondary infection that follows along with them or the donor site was deeper than it was supposed to be. So rehab management, where we kind of come into play here. So we look at this in terms of how can we maximize the <coughs> rehab component for these guys here. And ideally, it's really, really simple things. It's mobility, it's motion, it's exercise. I mean, that's what it comes down to. The stuff that was done in the 1800s that was published is looks just like the stuff that we do in 2015, just with different types of materials. Essentially, that same axiom applies. Mobility and motion is the key difference here. If we can get these guys moving faster and really stretching their limbs quicker, they get better outcomes. It doesn't get any more simple than that one. So we talk about rehab management here. It's, it's truly... It's a continuous cycle. They're not finite issues here. We want to have in there on burn day zero so that we can kind of maximize that burn day 365 and see what the outcomes are going to be. So we should be involved in that timeline. And we're the guys from a rehab standpoint that have seen these guys for the long term. So we position these patients. This is kind of the example of what we should be doing here. We want to minimize those positions of comfort. We want to maximize positions of functions for these patients. This is an example of just some of the upper extremity positionings that go on for patients. Uh, this is an axillary splint. So this guy had uh, a split through the skin graft here. There was axilla. Here's his donor site, and here's the fancy splint that we made for him. He kept that in place for about four days, removed that and take it down, and then we start doing mobilization and activity. If we didn't have a splint in that area there, and the doctor said, I oh, wouldn't need a splint and just kind of let this guy crumple down here, the graft would potentially heal, but it would heal in a shortened position. And that shortened graph would limit function for long-term action and mobility. So even though patients can't get out and be mobile, we can still do the right position. So think about this in terms of ICU management. This guy is on desk doorstep, on ventilators, on max pressors, on multiple issues. But I still want to get those arms out in position because I got goals too. Because if this guy does manage to heal and get out of there, and his arms are down like this, and his shoulders are rotating and protecting, his neck's all positioned like this one, that's how he's going to walk around for the next 80, 50 years of his life if he survives. So we want to maximize those things and do the right thing. Um, especially one of the big things, I think, from a PM&R standpoint is those patients that are prolonged in bed for a long period of time, we get a lot of scapular issues, a lot of protraction going on, and internal impingement issues that go on, especially in the older population. So being mindful of that in some of the older patients who do get the bigger burn injuries, of that positioning of the scapula and that motion of the scapula, these are simple things that we can do at the bedside and kind of mobilize these patients. So it's always good to ask therapy 
how they're doing, what they're doing with them. Um, hands are my pet peeve, um, and you can really screw someone for life if you screw up their hands early on there. So I really big emphasis on mo uh, important motion for upper extremity positioning. This is a hand split that our uh, burn doctor at Temple had just used. Applied one day, I couldn't make it to the LR. He said, I don't really need you. I can just put the split on as I want to. And I don't know if you guys can see. This hand is like this in the claw position. It's not in the lengthen position. He's actually put this guy into the anti -deform the deformity position. He's put him into a claw position. And this is what happens when these guys get in those prolonged areas. We lose the MCP flexion. We lose that mobility. If we lose the MPs, we lose the hand. I cannot emphasize that enough there. Early on in that phase there, once we start losing those MPs, we get long-term secondary complications that'll haunt these guys for the rest of their lives. So maximizing that length relationship and getting that good MP flexion is really critical early on. If the patient is not moving and not doing things, they should be in those additional splints, especially in the hands for longer periods of time because it only sets us up for failure in the long run. We do some lower extremity positioning, but I, I tend not to see issues with lower extremities. Um, the, the gentleman who was up in the burn unit, he was probably one of the hardest guys I've seen from a motion and mobility standpoint there because I don't think he was moving enough. Um, he should have been up and moving and not in that wheelchair for any periods of time or get moving because his hips and his knees are really, really tight. But usually we don't see big issues. I'll give you an example of just some of the problems we do see. Um, this is an example of um, this girl's toes were flipped up and actually scarred to the back of her foot. Surgeons did a surgery there to actually pull those down in the flexion, and then uh, we made a device that she could ambulate with and start walking on those toes early on there. So we're preserving that graft function, but it's still allowing us to do the functional mobility this girl needs to start doing early on. Again, learning those issues and getting out of those bad behaviors from the start makes a big difference. Um, so there was some research that was published in uh, 2012 um, by some Dutch researchers looking at splinting and issues around splint management. So this is what they kind of came up with from their standpoint. And um, you guys can read this. I kind of talked over a little bit. But essentially, they said that you know splints and these devices and all this exercise that we as therapists and PM and R people do actually increase the myofibroblast activity. And I agree with that. I do agree that you have to build those myofibroblasts to increase that function and mobility. And what they tend to, they, their conclusion was, well, if you're building these myofibroblasts at a microcosm level, then essentially you're creating more scar tissue and you're making it worse for function. So interesting paper, they put that out there. So we did a rebuttal to this one about uh, 12 months to the day after the fact there. And what we looked at was the research that was published from when splints were utilized in 1968 going on to 2008, looking at these areas of splinting, what we came up with was an odds ratio for a confidence interval, looking at if you utilize the splints in different areas of the body, what was your percentage of contraction? So we looked at this odds ratio we came up with for less than six months, we had a, essentially a 95% confidence interval that you would get a contraction in your axilla of about 90%. <clears throat> Okay, if you did the same area that extrapolated it out there for longer, for six to 12 months, that contraction rate drops down to 58%. And if you go even longer than that, contraction rate drops down to 32%. We went across different areas there. So what we found was that, no, the splints don't really cause more issues of a contracture. It's the application, the use of those splints, and the non-use is what makes the contracture worse. And this is what I kind of like to show in difference here. So here's all my science, all my kind of you know, BS stuff kind of make you fall asleep. This is the thing you really can't walk away from, right? So this is a picture of two kids separated by about 30-some years of medical research, right? So the guy on the right was from the journal of Trauma in a venue called Burns, Burn Management. And the one on the left is an Afghani child from, uh, I think it was Time Magazine published an article about this. Both these guys at the time got the best level of Department of Defense medical care that could be applied to them. They got the best grafting, skin grafting, wound care that was available at the time. What neither one of these kids got was a splint or therapy. So look at those two pictures. You guys see a difference? I don't. They look relatively the same. I mean, everything kind of grows down, skin grows down. So that, to me, kind of supports my theory that the splitting in this range of motion and mobility is critical with these guys because we can prevent this shit from happening. This is, it's... That's obvious there. And we see this 
Um, I do a lot of development work. We had a group that went to Africa this week uh, that I couldn't go on, but they're going to bring back some horrific pictures of things that aren't being done. And it's really simple things. It's simple exercise, range of motion, and management. We've done some studies looking at uh, laser Doppler imaging on materials here and applications for face masks for patients. And we're able to show that we can actually create and decrease blood flow, essentially cut off blood flow to scarring via application of pressure. And we're able to show this one serially over time here that decreasing that pressure gradient through splinting and management can help to de scar tissue and therefore improve function. Um, and we also looked at some of this data we said, okay, if you apply these devices for a long period of time, that's a good idea. But what happens when patients just take them off and they tell you they're wearing them? So we did some testing looking at this early on. And even if we get the patients to at least wear these devices for a short period of time, we found the body actually adapts that structure. And that if you only wear the device for a small period of time, actually it'll take up to 45 minutes of time for your body to recapture that blood flow. So maybe even having a device on for a shorter period of time will make a difference than having no device at all. So what we're always trying to do with all these cases is to minimize that scar. That scar is what the big problem is. And there's two different types of scarring process there. Hypertrophic scars are the most common ones. These are ones that we see. These are the ones that we can kind of make a change on. The keloids are a little bit different and a little bit more of a bane of my existence. But we can do some things in these with better surgical intervention early on. We have about 18 to 20 months that we can change the scar process. I always tell that with the patients. If you think about this in the long term, you have to start moving now because it's a long range run for them. And if wound healing takes longer than 21 days, we have about an 80% chance of scarring. Here's the hypertrophic scars. They are really nasty, real tough. They contract. They work aggressively. They continue to grow. They don't take a vacation. They don't take a coffee break. They don't take a pee break. They're working 24 7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, never take time off. The keloids are the ones that are a little bit different. Um, so these are the guys here. I have not had many successful keloid scars that I've been able to do any kind of change with with silicone and pressure. I get some good results um, for cases where we have ear keloids that are really small and relatively contained. But I didn't think these really existed anymore. These are two pictures from like 1970s that I borrowed from one of friends of mine. This is a picture that came to me in 2012 from a surgeon in Baltimore. Um, who knew I made these little ear cups and she called me up found my name and said hey I'm doing this case in this kid tomorrow can you come in and make an ear cup for her? and I'm like well I could get to Baltimore and be able to work this out I said but send me a picture so I know what I'm looking at so I can kind of prep and when I got this picture I called her up and I said are you out of your mind like what are you gonna do with her in surgery because her plan was gonna be like to try to bulk this whole area here and say oh this is a girl she's 12 years old She's had multiple surgeries done to her, and she's had infection in that area there. There's nothing I can do to change this one, but the surgeon thought I was going to cut this off and make it all better. I was like, my God, lady, you're going to make this kid horribly, horribly worse. Um, so hypertrophic scarring, again, the red, they're raised, they're rigid. These are the ones we can see and make a difference on and change with them overall. When they're more mature, they're more pale, they're more pliable, they planar. You can kind of see... I'm not going to be able to do a lot more with this guy here, but he's got pretty good functional range overall, and he's able to get around here. So things and devices that we apply um, for burns, some of the stuff that we do. Pressure garments are one of the big ones. You know, 25 to 20 millimeters of mercury of pressure helps to overcome some of that gradient pressure standard of that blood flow to the area there. Helps to remodel the collagen, decrease the fibroblast here, and decrease the collagen synthesis. These guys have to be worn about 23 hours a day for the two years. I wouldn't want to do it. I know I would have a hard time with it, but it's really a good process here to help in terms of managing the burns. We also do a lot of inserts and conformers. Essentially with these pressure garments, there's different grades of pressure. So an axillary fold is only going to get maximum pressure when the guy's arm is over his head. But how many people walk around arms over their head? So we have to do things to actually create inserts in those areas here and maximize that pressure and mitigate some of that scarring response. This is some of the uh, protocols that are out there, uh, but you can kind of see there's no standard protocols in, in TENS or NMES's materials. Ultrasound, there is some evidence-based research done with that one. It stimulates some of the collagenase activity with some standard applications. Hot packs can be used in some areas here. I'm a big fan of paraffin wax. Um, it tends to kind of moisturize that skin area there. It, it forms with that transepidermal water loss there, lubricate the area, and allow for that aggressive 
uh, active range of motion and mobility. Um, fluidotherapy also works as well, but it's kind of hard to kind of manage that with that paraffin therapy in there because of the material they use. And scar massaging is, is something that can be used as well here. Uh, psychosocial adaptation is a real big part of that recovery process here. We do some, um, a lot of tattooing that's available to be done now, as well as this camouflage makeup and materials. A lot of the Hollywood um, studios now, um, with a J.R. Martinez, they're working on some components. They actually have applications of makeup that can be applied for long-term functional recovery and issues. Um, we do a lot of silicone gel sheeting, and this is some of the research that I get a lot of work into here. So we know that silicones work. I still don't know exactly how they work, but they tend to be relatively effective. Um, and there's a couple different things we looked at in terms of the mechanism of action. There has been some issue around that blood flow area there, that silicones are not mediated by changes in blood flow and a pressure effect. We'd be able to show that with a laser doppel imager. Um, some of these things have been a little bit better. What we do know is that silicones work essentially by a catalyst reaction there. It's a combination of the best hydrogenation, oxygen tension, providing a, a, a good barrier, occluding the area of the skin there, and providing that temperature change. And that temperature balance, I think, is really the key thing. And Thomas Musto has done some research talking about these three things kind of working together, providing an optical scar, scar outcome. And he actually believes that this combination of these materials helps to create a signaling mechanism within the body. That's what he's working on right now, trying to figure out how this actually works in process to downregulate the extra, extracellular matrix production and mitigate some of that scarring process. Some really cool stuff in terms of research standpoint. So things I want you guys to take home with, most importantly, is that we should be able to prevent these scars as quickly and as effectively as possible. That splitting and positioning, those things and range of motion and mobility are crucial. They should be done all the time here. We should understand and respect that wound and skin healing process there because everyone heals a little bit differently. And then healing is both internal and external, and you guys should be involved in the first day of therapy. So I'll show you a real quick case study. This lady took a seizure, fell on top of an open cook stove. She had a full thinness injury to her face and her mouth. She was that lady that had an alloderm material that was placed underneath her skin, that white stuff, and she had a sheet graft that was placed over top. This is what we did. We did exercises with her. We made a... Uh, an external device here that actually pulled and put pressure on our face and on our mouth. And that's how she looked at the end. So, you know, I think we do a lot of good work and we can do a lot of things with these docs to help mitigate uh, these contractures. So, thank you guys so much. Appreciate all the time. And hope you have a good rest of the day. <laughs> no questions? You don't think there's any differences in the treatment with a heterotopic constipation or? I believe that it's a similar treatment with that in terms of the medication. Um, I think there's more research. There's less research in burns overall. I think it's a great thing to look at from a burn perspective. I think looking at some of the TBI research has been helpful for me. That's why I applied some of their techniques for some of the burn patients that we've seen. But there hasn't been much research overall in it. I had a similar question. Just um, in terms of the wound healing, would they let us do um, like NSAIDs or uh, irradiation, or do they kind of try and stick strictly to the phosphonates? Um, I think if you ask the question, yeah. they would let you kind of go in that route. Um, I, you know, routinely, I always kind of yanked in Dr. Maiden when I had the bad cases, and the docs, the burn center, were always a little bit like, "No, it's not that. It's just an issue. He's not having it in there." So I would try to drag him in a little earlier and try to get some of the other materials on board. Um, the big thing is trying to get that bone scan. I think it's it's sad that it's a monetary issue in terms of like getting it on there, but if we had that as baseline and did that on some of these cases here, then we'd have a knowledge base. We always see them at six months and 12 months later, and no one is ever doing a bone scan on admission on those injection or those big trauma injuries. I'm thinking, well, you radiate them for checking their C-spine and everything else. What's the big difference of keeping them there and doing the other bone scan too? I mean, it's my thought process. It's a good research project. All right. I think I'm going to try to get this thing out here. No, absolutely not, man. Um, how do you determine the frequency of wound care? Um, is it, I mean, is it, usually when they're upstairs, it's daily. Mm -hmm. And then I know in outpatient, you transition to every other day or longer. Is that mostly based on secretions or is it a timing thing? Or? It could be a combination of how much fluid they have in the area there, as well as how, how the wounds are looking, looking at also any deeper structures that are involved. Um, 
I'm a big fan of, we have, you know, millions of these dressings that claim, you know, 10 day, 14 day, 21 day effectiveness, never look at it and see it, but we routinely want to take a peek and see what the wounds are doing. So it's kind of counterproductive to me because I think that cellular process, the less you disturb it, the better the cellular process is occurring. So if we can keep them on for longer periods of time and not look at it, it's a better thing. But the docs want to take a peek and say, oh, okay, how's it looking today? I got to look at it and see. So we haven't found that happy medium. That's a good question. Though. All right. How do I eject this puppy? That's the only thing. Just yank it out? Who said just pull it out? Who's a smart guy? I like that. All right.